So I'm Steve Pears. I'm a professor of law at the University of Essex. And what I'm going to talk about is the, the way in which the movement of people might end up being regulated in an, an association agreement between the EU and the UK after Brexit. So, um, an association agreement is a sort of standard type of agreement which the EU signs with non-EU countries. It has to be agreed unanimously by the EU, and it usually has to be approved by national parliaments. But there are some limitations on that. It can be applied provisionally if the, uh, all the member states want to do that, so that, uh, that kind of speeds things up. So it could be applied provisionally from the day of Brexit or whatever day is uh, relevant after Brexit. And the, the national ratifications take longer, but the, the law would uh, be applied straight away. And also when it comes to implementing it by adopting further laws on social security or, or migration, perhaps it doesn't necessarily need a unanimous vote for the things that come afterwards so uh, or national ratification. So there are ways of, of simplifying things a lot. Uh, above and beyond the, the initial decision making. And the European Parliament has to consent to the original association agreement, but then doesn't have a role when it comes to implementing it with, with further measures. So that's the basic idea of an association agreement. It doesn't have to be called an association agreement. And uh, there are uh, cases in the past of an association agreement legally, which wasn't called that, because the other side didn't want it to be called that. So when the Swiss and North African countries at different times have, have had association agreements with the EU, which weren't actually called that. So we, we could go that way with the United Kingdom if they don't want to use that name on the UK side because some voters might be upset. You could call it something else in the title, but it would be an, an association agreement. Um, we don't even have to have an association agreement. There are other types of agreements which the EU has with non-EU countries, with Russia and ex-Soviet countries and a number of countries in Asia, it has partnership agreements. It's also uh, agreed partnership agreements with Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand. It's agreed or negotiating in recent years, which go alongside trade agreements. So we could have something like that as well with the United Kingdom. Uh, but either way, whether it's a partnership agreement or an association agreement, that would be the probably the main mechanism of dealing with the UK's relationship with the European Union. It might not cover everything. There might be a separate deal, for instance, on criminal law and policing and, and foreign policy issues. But it will be the main mechanism of dealing with the economic aspects of the relationship. So it will either be a comprehensive free trade deal like the agreement with Canada, or it would be something uh, bringing the United Kingdom, or keeping the United Kingdom within the EU's internal market, like the agreement with Norway and Iceland, the, the European Economic Area. Now, it doesn't have to be exactly the same as the deal with Canada or exactly the same as the deal with Norway. Uh, uh, you know, lots of the EU treaties with other countries are, are different in, in different ways. They like to start with standard models, but then they, they, they get uh, different texts by the time you, you sit down and negotiate. So what might it say on the free movement of people? Now, the agreement with Canada might well say anything. If we go down the route of an agreement with Canada, it probably won't say very much about the free movement of people. That, that would be the consequence of a decision to focus on movement of goods and services in a free trade framework, which is less intensive than an internal market participation and um, would almost certainly mean no, no uh, real commitments on the movement of persons. So that's one basic choice which the UK could make. Now, what if it made the other choice and said, let's have an agreement which is about single market participation, not the EEA, but ultimately something that will be uh, somewhat similar to the EEA would be signing up to single market participation. And that in, in the EEA, and in the set of agreements with Switzerland, that in principle, that does include fully the free movement of people. And the EU position in the negotiations with the UK for the post-Bexit framework at the moment is quite solid that it doesn't want to exclude the free movement of people from the single market. If you want to deal with giving us full participation in the single market of great interest to, say, financial services and and uh, um, car industry, for instance, where the Japanese uh, uh, 
investment, uh, the, uh, the businesses investing in the UK have said, well, um, the single market is very important to us for our continued investment because it greatly simplifies our trade from car manufacturers in the UK uh, to the EU. It's greatly interesting to Japanese pharmaceutical industries. It greatly simplifies um, their exports, you know, quite a large British export industry of pharmaceuticals from the UK to the EU. They, they've warned they might not continue investment if we don't have single market participation. So if that's the case, if you want to go down single market participation on those sorts of grounds of trying to secure continued exports to the European Union at the highest possible level for a number of goods and services industries, the EU position is, well, you have to sign up to the free movement of people. Well, that's as a starting position. A lot of people assume that that's sort of an absolute, but they have budged on things before. So if you go back to the renegotiation of the UK's role in the EU that David Cameron negotiated, uh, culminating in Feb. Now, uh, obviously, some, a lot of people were disappointed and thought it was a very weak renegotiation. But th th there is one point that uh, we'd look at. If you, if, you go, if you went back to those negotiations and look at the, uh, all the newspaper articles and comments that people made during those negotiations, a huge number of people said the Polish government will never accept any kind of deal reducing benefits for Polish workers. That's a red line for them. It will affect them too much. Too many Polish workers here have too much to lose. They will not agree to that. That's um, horrible. That will never get to the Polish parliament from their Polish point of view. But of course, Poland did accept that. All the member states did accept that. And many people said they would never do that. They did accept that. Um, and from people the point of view of people in the UK, that wasn't much of a deal. The point of view of some of the uh, member states, that was a big concession that they made to the UK that benefits for workers in work benefits could be limited and that um, uh, child benefits exported to children in Poland and other member states, that, that could be limited too. There's little big concessions uh, they were willing to make to the UK that the people predicted they wouldn't make. So what does that mean for the EU-UK relationship post-Brexit? Well, it may mean that... The EU position is they won't negotiate on free movement of people, you must accept it as it is, is a negotiating position that they would be willing to accept some limitation on the free movement of people as com compared to how it is now. I mean, it's not completely unrealistic or fantastic for the UK to have as a negotiating position. We want to continue in the single market, um, but we don't want free movement to continue of people exactly as it has been up until now. Now, I think it would be unrealistic to say we want no free movement of people but the rest of the single market participation. It wouldn't be so obviously unrealistic to say we'll accept the free movement of people with some limitations as compared to how it is now. And they would be limitations that would be significant enough for the British government to be able to come back to Parliament and to the British public and say, well, you know, we now have regained control of the numbers of EU citizens coming into our country. Now, what would that mean in practice? Um, well, it, you would start by continuing to apply existing EU laws on free movement of people, but you'd um, impose, I think, uh, some kind uh, of possibility of limits for the UK government. And that, of course, it would be reciprocated, uh, member states of the EU would be able to uh, limit in some way British citizens coming there to match what uh, the UK could, could do in Britain uh, for EU citizens. So what kind of limits are these? Well, some people have suggested that we don't let EU citizens into the country unless they already have a job offer. And I think immediately that is a non-starter. It's surprising really that that's even being discussed seriously, in my opinion. Think of all the other people who can come and visit the UK without a visa, uh, like uh, Americans and Japanese and Canadians. They don't have to have a job offer to come and visit the country. And there are, of course, lots of EU citizens who are always going to want to come to the UK as tourists or to visit family um, or for other short-term reasons. To say they're going to refuse to let you in unless you have a job offer is just peculiar. It'll take a long time at the borders to sort of process uh, people individually and check whether they have job offers too. So that really isn't uh, a workable idea uh, because we're bound to have tourism and other sorts of flows not related to employment into the country. So what we have to do 
um, is, uh, first of all, negotiate with the European Union, if this is feasible, some kind of um, limits that we might be able to apply. Now, they won't be at the border, they would be at the employer level, which of course is where we already enforce the limits that we have on non-EU citizens working. All those uh, you know, many hundreds of thousands of American citizens who, who visit the UK every year as visitors are uh, prohibited in principle from working here. Now, how does that work? What stops them going on and finding work illegally? Well, many of them don't want to do it, but uh, if they did do it, of course, employers in Britain are obliged to check people's um, nationality and to see whether they're entitled uh, to work and they can be penalised if they hire people who aren't authorised to work, uh, non-EU citizens mainly who aren't authorised to work. So uh, that's the way in which we check it. There's always be somebody working under the table. But that's the way in which we obviously deter um, uh, a large number of people who would otherwise consider looking uh, for illegal work and staying on, in the country without authorisation after their, their uh, uh, authorised stay runs out from working. And that would be the same type of approach that we take to EU citizens. Um, employers would have to check whether they are authorised to work uh, before they offered them a job, uh, before they concluded a contract. So what does that mean? Uh, what, what sort of restrictions might exist? Well, um, we could simply uh, try and negotiate on the basis that we could set numerical targets um, and they could possibly be triggered by criteria like a rise in the unemployment rate, or possibly simply a general power that uh, wouldn't be then subject to review or dispute whenever we wanted to, to set uh, numerical quotas of some, t some type on um, the number of EU citizens getting jobs. And perhaps that could be open to some kind of flexible approach. So it could be we would decide to give, let's say, power to the Scottish government to decide that within Scotland they don't want to apply uh, limits on the number of EU uh, nationals, or they don't want to, or who get work contracts, or they don't want to uh, or have exactly the same limits as would apply in uh, the rest of the country. So it's one way of addressing the Scottish government's concern, for instance, about wanting to stay in the EU single market, is they could have different rules on these issues. Um, and perhaps other, other, other different rules on other devolved administrations, or a more flexible one in London, or, or uh, uh, or things like that. So you could have regional differences. You could also have differences based on salary. So if you're offering a, a, a job which has pay for less than £20,000, that has some kind of limit on it. It would either be covered by quotas or in some way you'd have to have a job preference. You'd have to prove to the Home Office that no British citizen could do that job um, and so on. So uh, you, above that level, uh, either you wouldn't have constraints. Or it could be based on skills that they'd be certain criteria such as having a, a master's degree or having a, an undergraduate degree and that you don't have controls of, uh, on workers who need that degree as a as a qualification to their job you would have controls on people who, who, who didn't uh, who didn't have a degree or you could base it on occupation if we have no problem with doctors coming to the country there's no need to um, have approval or limits on the number of EU doctors coming to the country there might be other jobs of course for which you would want to have you know, some kind of approval process. So there were various possibilities that could either be spelled out in the EU-UK agreement or there could be a lot of general power uh, to limit the numbers on each side, which we could then change as we wanted to um, in terms of uh, thinking, looking at what the economic situation is, uh, looking at the public concern about the levels of debt migration and so on. You could, you could alter those numbers over time. It would be, I think, best to have flexibility there. Uh, so uh, as to be able to choose uh, in different circumstances exactly how we might want to limit the total number of EU citizens getting work. So I think that will be a crucial question. Do we go for that sort of deal in the first place of single market participation with some limits on the free movement of people? Or do we just sort of shrug about our shoulders about the whole thing, go for a comprehensive free trade agreement and um, with lots of maybe additional extra rules about some of the industries we're, we're particularly interested in uh, and try and uh, deal with those concerns that way. Probably the single market uh, deal will have the, uh, a more favourable impact on the British economy as compared to a comprehensive free trade trade agreement. They'll both be difficult to negotiate um, and uh, within a two-year time frame, although that Article 50 time frame can be um, 
circumvented not only by the possibility of extending it, but by uh, a transitional deal, let's say, which keeps the UK participating in some EU laws for a while before uh, it, uh, it negotiates a final agreement with the European Union. So we technically have left the EU, continue to apply some EU law uh, for another year or two or three until we get that final deal agreed. And then it doesn't necessarily have to be ratified by national parliaments because an association agreement, as I say, or other types of EU deals can be agreed to be put in force provisionally. So those are the two basic choices we have to make. One of them involving important questions about uh, EU-UK immigration and whether we want to have special rules on it. The other one probably would say very little and most, let's say a visa waiver agreement uh, between the EU and the UK. And we'd be making, at the time when we decided, I think we'd have to decide at an early stage, we'd be making a basic decision on the trade-offs between um, the economic benefits of single market participation on the one hand and the political concerns that people have about the total number of EU citizens coming to the UK and the other. I think the economic argument points towards a single market deal. The political concerns that some people have uh, about uh, the EU numbers point towards a comprehensive free trade deal with less benefit for the UK economy instead. But then the real political calculation is, can we try and have a compromise in a, an association agreement which says you have single market participation but which does allow for enough limits to be placed on EU citizens to satisfy at least some of the British people with concerns about those total numbers. Can we reach a deal? Is it possible to reach a deal which has enough limits that will say, OK, we have effectively taken back enough control of those numbers to, to satisfy people who are concerned about that, but still have single market participation? So that's going to be a crucial question. There are others about contributions to the EU budget and the way in which we might uh, have to apply future EU law or have involvement in its negotiation. But that, I think, is, is going to be one of the single biggest questions that we face in the negotiations and which the government would have to decide on at an early stage.